Welcome to the Microbiome Report powered by Biome Health. I'm your host, Andrea Ween, and today is another straight from the gut episode with Afif Ganoum, the CEO of Biome. If you are new to these episodes, these are ones where Afif and I get on, we do a little what if scenario around the world of the microbiome, and then talk about some studies that we have found interesting or articles that we've come across in the last few weeks. This episode gets into a bunch of different very wide-ranging studies that were done. Very interesting. Maybe one of them sounds a little woo-woo to you. It's about microbiome auras, but I promise you, it's very, very interesting. Give the episode a listen and let us know if you have any comments or feedback. If you've come across any studies or things that you would want us to talk about on the show. And don't forget, you can save 15% off any product on Biome's website with the code POD15. You can also find show notes for this episode on the website at biomehealth.com slash pages slash podcast. Without further ado, let's get to the show. Afif, hey, how you doing? Good. How's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. We have some really interesting stuff to talk about today, but I had a a what if moment the other day and people might laugh because this is how it came about. So my kid has been licking everything, which I'm sure most parents can relate to, but lately he's been really into the bottom of his shoes, which is just lovely. (laughs) And I was thinking, what if we had a Shazam for microbes. So it's like, okay, my kid's licking the bottom of his shoe. Like, is there anything really harmful on there? Or yeah, what's in there? And like, kind of breaks it down. Like, okay, this amount of, you know, E. coli It's like, you'll, he'll be fine. His stomach acid will kill it. But like, maybe you shouldn't let him lick the left shoe. But even just like broader than that, wouldn't that be such an interesting feature to have to be able to carry that around with you? Like what microbes are here? Is this something I want to be picking up? Conceptually, that does exist, not as turnkey to your point as you'd want it to be. Two challenges. One, for something like that where you're like, well, what's on the bottom of this? The problem is you have to kind of analyze like every germ and be like, these are the germs we found, right? But if you're really worried about like, like you said, E. coli or some like heavy duty bad guys, you could probably make a wand or something that does like a rapid sort of test for like a few specific really bad organisms, but yeah, that would actually be awesome. Like I I remember one time kids really wanted to go to Chuck E. Cheese of all places. And I turn around and I went, I went with my sister and her kids and my niece is sucking the carpet in Chuck E. Cheese (laughs) to the point that there's a giant red or not red, uh, wet circle around the carpet, which I'm like, Oh my God, that's awful. So I think that, you know, you'd sell a lot of those at Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Chuck E. Cheese was like one of those places that was just, I feel like it was just a cesspool. Like every once in a while, there'd be like an outbreak of, I don't know, some type of horrible conjunctivitis or something from Chuck E. Cheese. Well, it was like one of those things when we were kids, like in the 80s, it seemed amazing. And now you look at it and you're like, this is this the same place? Yeah. You're like, gross, gross. The other thing I was thinking of too, though, is like, what if, so there was a study done years and years ago where they gave kids a bunch of different foods and then let them, it, they were babies. I think it was like six month old babies, seven month and let them choose what they would eat over the course of, I forget how long, maybe a couple of weeks. And at first, like the kids did just go for like the sugary, you know, easy kind of carb stuff. But then over time they started to choose things that their body was deficient in. So they were also doing all these blood works and things on them during the course of the study. And they started to notice like, oh, and when the kids need vitamin C, like they'll eat more of the whatever, or, uh, you know, if they need more iron, like they'll go for the liver. And so they really started to be able to intuit what their bodies needed based on what was in front of them. And so then I was thinking, what if our kids not only explore with their mouth, because that's obviously what babies are doing when they're eating all the stuff, but my son's almost two now. So he's a little bit past that phase of mouthing everything. Like what if he's licking the bottom of his shoe? Because he's like, when I do that, I feel better because I am getting some type of microbe that I'm deficient in. I don't even, maybe (laughs) (laughs) that, yeah, it's, well, again, we go, we've talked about this before that we've gone from one utter extreme to the other as far as like germ control and especially our kids. So I'm a big believer. It's like pretty hard, you know, for kids to, 
even like like you said, eating off a floor or like you know shoe, is it really that bad for them? I, I don't know. You know what I mean? It, it, that is kind of interesting. Like, is it like it, I, I always think of things like iron when you say that, like actually makes them feel better. But yeah, wild to think. I think that we really are born with this intuitive sense of what our body needs. And then as we grow, we get talked out of it or we talk ourselves out of it or society tells us we should eat this or do that and we lose touch with that. And I think that is one of the nice things about what's happening. I mean, what, the wellness industry obviously is has a lot of issues, but I think that connection to our body again and listening to what we intuitively know to be right and tapping into that I think that that's important. And I think yeah. that's something that I can see that he does, right? Well, I, I literally have been struggling with this the last couple of months. So to your point, and a lot of the stuff, it's not even overt. You just internalize it and you really don't realize it. And what I, I started this thing called Heart 75, where it's like you work out two times a day, you don't do alcohol. It's more of a mental challenge than anything. But what I found was that two thirds of the day, would pass and I would be so tired. And, you know, I was eating like salads, lean this, and I was avoiding carbs. And it wasn't until I added like, and, and I for years avoided like rice um, and like potatoes, anything, because I, I just think of, oh, I'm going to feel bloated. I'm going to feel, you know, gross. Someone had said, oh, you just throw a sweet potato into your lunch. So I did that and I found these awesome like Thai packages that have rice and curry in them, but they're prepackaged. So I know like calorically what's in them night and day. It was funny to think like, I've literally avoided this source of foods and, and thought like, these are not good for me. You know, just relearning to trust my body saying, like, listen, I feel like I need to eat. This really is amazing. I think about, I was a big friends fan and this is a funny story, but or a funny episode, but it's true. I see it in clients too. So Phoebe, when she's pregnant, she was like a hardcore vegan on the show. And then she gets pregnant and all she wants to eat is hamburgers. And so, you know, in the episode, Joey tries to go vegetarian. So it like equals out, <laughs> you know, she'll eat the meat and he won't, obviously right. it doesn't work, but it's the same thing, right? Like I have a pregnant client right now and she says like, I really want to be able to eat X, but you know, my doctor says this and I'm like, your body is tell we have to listen to our body. Like, of course, always listen to your doctors in question them, you know, if you feel like something is off, but I'm not going to ever overrule a doctor's orders, but you should also listen to your body. Like your body knows best and our little people, like their bodies know best. And I think too, now we're getting a little bit off topic, but when, when we have kids like clear their plates or like eat everything, you know, they're not really listening to their body telling them when they're full. And then right. what does that turn into, right? This like lifelong disordered eating or obesity or whatever it might be. So I think it's important that we understand that kids know themselves better than we know them in terms of knowing their bodies. And we, and tap into that and, and support that instead of arguing against it. Totally. All right. So another article that I came across, this was kind of, I have two really fun ones actually. So there was an article in Newsweek and the title is your microbiome extends in a microbial cloud around you like an aura. So essentially all of the microbes on your skin and your body, they're projected out. And let me see if I can find how far I wanted to say it was like six feet around you. So the air surrounding wow. 11 different people in a sanitized room, they spent four hours in a room together. Yeah. Basically they found that these people were like throwing off their bacteria all around themselves, which sounds disgusting, but also is so interesting. And you start to think like when people are talking about aura as an energy, you know, getting a little bit woo woo, but is it this, you know, is it that actually like we are having an interaction with the energy because there's a microbial component that's going out around us? I don't even yeah, know where to start with this wild. discussion, but it's like, how cool is that? Well, I start thinking about like almost your microbiome fingerprint. You know what I mean? Like, can you actually, you know, track people? Can you end up like, have you ever heard of this? This is again, a little bit of a, sidewinder off of this, but have you ever heard of these things where they're like, oh, there's 
a dog that can detect cancer. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and like, you can just smell it. And it's, it's like, I wonder if that, you know, a hundred years from now is where we end up where it's, it's again, this mechanisms going on in our body, literally we can detect, you know what I mean? And it makes sense because we know on the infectious disease side that you definitely will project out viruses. Like we've obviously been talking about with COVID and stuff. So it makes sense. You would project out other organisms that are native to you, but I wonder how unique of an identifier it is to you. Right. Well, this is saying that it's incredibly identifiable, even to the point where you could use it as a fingerprint, like for security reasons, you know, this article gets into that. And then, well, what happens if you take a round of antibiotics? Is it altering it in that sense enough that, you know, your devices wouldn't recognize you or whatever. So I think it's pretty identifiable. Like they were able to tell the difference between individual people's, they're calling them cloud signatures. And they were also able to identify if it was a man or a woman in the chamber because the microbes in the air changed around her. So they were more lactobacillus because they are intuiting that it was because of the vaginal aspect. Wow. Crazy. That is wild. Yes. So obviously we always link to all of these in our show notes, but I'll definitely put this one up. And then you think too, like to your point about dogs being able to smell out something, it also happens with like a stroke person, you know, there's all these other, or like seizures, you know, so is that like a quick shift in like the microbial makeup of something? Yeah, like what are they actually detecting? Is it like, right? I've always heard in the context of smell, but is it, is it smell or is it actually microorganisms they're picking up? Yeah, this, it's very, very, very interesting. I, I feel like we're going between uh, a deep discussion and a discussion you have after buying stuff at Spencer's Gifts. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, well, the, the whole article was just, I saw it and I'm like, this cannot be real. And then it's like a very legit study with Martin Blazer, who is, you know, yeah, yeah, he's a, big a very guy. reputable scientist. He actually was not involved in the study, but he is talking about it. He says, just like the detectives today are dusting a room to look for fingerprints, maybe in the future, they'll take a big vacuum and see what microbes are there. It's certainly not tomorrow, but it might be possible. That's wild. Yeah. All right. The next one I pulled up that I thought was interesting, you know, a lot of the times we will say that microbiome and gut health is tied to so many different aspects. And Mind Body Green did an article with the five gut types. And I I just liked how they were broken down. And I think it's a good way to think about it. So I'm just going to read through them. So the first one was the digestive gut. This was an issue with like bloating, constipation, IBS, SIBO, candida, heartburn, GERD, uh, nausea, those types of things. The second one was the immune gut. So these are more skin breakouts, autoimmunity, allergies, asthma, sinus congestion, and frequent colds. The third one was the toxic gut. So this is like mast cell activation, chemical sensitivities, mold, Lyme disease. Um, This is also like the nothing helps people. Like I keep doing stuff and nothing seems to be helping. Then they have hormonal and metabolic gut. So yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but what's the context of this? Did they, is this sort of like their vibe around different guts or is it based on, you know, science? Like what, what, what are they using to categorize these? So it was a, a different, a functional medicine specialist is what they're called that basically has been able to like put people in their practice anecdotally into one of these categories. And it kind of just gives a place for them to start in terms of treatment. So if someone's exhibiting symptoms of more of a hormonal gut, you know, what does the treatment look like in terms of healing the gut versus someone that's dealing with constipation? So that was the context of. Got it. It says you can certainly experience symptoms from all gut types. However, your primary type is what I use to identify the body's default tendency. It's so funny. So you had me download this plugin called (laughs) Toucan. And so it changes Isn't some of the words great? in my in my thing to Spanish. It is amazing. If anyone is learning, trying to learn Spanish, get Toucan is a little plugin that will change some of the words in your on every web page into Spanish. And sometimes I don't know them. So I had to roll over your body's default tendency. Yeah. It's <laughs> well, well, Toucan, not to go into the languages now, but 
it is super cool. Basically, you're reading an article and five words will change, right? And the idea is like, that's how you actually learn through like osmosis. And uh, yeah, it's it, it's funny though. Once in a while, I'm, I have like a docu sign up or something and it's changed a couple of words. I'm like, why is it? Oh, too good. Yes, the same thing happened. I actually took a screenshot of something and sent it to your dad recently. And he was like, it was the biome gut test that I did for Miles, my son. And he was like, oh my gosh, we have to talk to the biome team because some of these words are in Spanish. Like they shouldn't be in Spanish. And I was like, no, 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 no. But if you've told me about that, <laughs> oh, it's not, hilarious. the biome test is fine. I promise. It's so funny. Anyway, the fourth one was hormonal and metabolic gut. And then the second or the fifth one was brain gut. So anxiety, depression, ADHD. And I just thought it was a nice breakdown of when we talk about like every symptom can be related to gut health, this was like, okay, yes, that's true. But you probably have dominance in one of these different types of guts if you're having issues. And it was just the first time I've seen it broken down like this really. And I appreciated the article. I think it can be helpful for some people. Yeah. And we've definitely seen like, there's this, you know, when we do talk about the microbiome as a fingerprint, a lot of times we assume everybody's going to have absolutely everything unique to them. And we've actually seen in our testing database that that it is more similar to this. We don't use, you know, these, you know, names, but that people do cluster. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to this being about feel, like you're saying, like a functional medicine physician saying, listen, this is kind of how I'm seeing people divide up. So, you know, a lot of times it comes down to like, what's actually useful to help you get to where you need to go, right? Because 99% of the time, you don't actually care what's in your gut. You want to know, like, I don't feel well, or, you know, I'm stressed. And if that does have a tie to your gut, you want to understand what you can do. Well, and I think too, when we start talking and people don't understand that so many things can be tied to their gut to have a framework like this, where it's like, well, no, no, like a lot of people have this issue and they are seeing hormonal or they're, they're seeing acne, you know, let's say, and that could be tied to gut. And this is, these are the reasons why, and here's kind of that bucket that you might fall into. And it gives you places to start exploring rather than jumping to like, well, I'm just going to go take Accutane and try to tame the symptom, you know? So it just gives people a, another holding on point, if that makes sense. Accutane, class of 1996, by the way. Hey, man, me too. I was Accutane, let's see, class of 2010. And knowing what I know now, I'm like, and it and it didn't work fully, you know, like it, it did and then it didn't. And I actually am working with a client right now who came to me and said, I'm going on Accutane again. And I said, no, 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 no. Oh, let's wow. like you know, we can work on this. And she's 23. It's like, no, you know, let's just get a couple things under control. I said, give me a month, <laughs> give me a month. And if you're not seeing any improvement, like we can talk about it, but I know that she will. So it's just, yeah, don't, don't mask the symptom because it's just going to pop up elsewhere and it might not pop up in the form of acne. Right. But if you're not right. healing that underlying root cause of why that acne is there in the first place, It'll pop up somewhere else, autoimmune disease or another type of skin thing or cancer, you know. So it's not the answer to just try to tamp down the one symptom. I love Josh Catalis, who we've had on a couple of times. He always says that symptoms are the language of the body. So that's your body trying to talk to you. So don't just try to silence it. I think try to tune in and listen. Well, as a 16 year old taking it, I would do it again. <laughs> you would I, it worked for me I like I didn't but have now knowing cystic... what you know now if you could have someone come in and say like it is your gut well, health and it's this like let's do it from a holistic perspective well I will say this I would not do it as a woman because of all there's like super strong side effects for women like uh when you talk about a 23 year old I'm actually surprised they would even consider it because of you know there's such serious side effects if there's pregnancy and stuff um yeah you have but, to go on birth control like you can't you have to go oh, on birth like, control and like you have to sign a waiver that if you do somehow end up getting pregnant that you'll terminate the pregnancy yeah it's like severe deform oh you know it's very bad situation so and again this is many moons ago now but i don't remember having any issues but it worked you know well <laughs> <laughs> I would still caution anyone who's thinking about going on Accutane to look for the root cause, even though it might work. Agreed. Fair enough. Thank you. 16-year-old Afif <laughs> would, would not agree, but... I'm actually surprised that your dad, knowing so much about 
the microbiome wouldn't think, oh, maybe there's a well, gut this component is, here. Again, this is like, jeez, we had just moved to Cleveland. You know what I mean? Like this is yeah, a, this is a right. long time ago. He was ago. still early in his research too. To- totally. You're this so old 25 now. 25 years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm a thousand kidding. years old now. <laughs> my dad, I had a birthday the other day and uh, this is my daughter who's four. How old do you think I am? She goes, 62. I'm like, oh. You're like, well, yeah. no, try again. <laughs> Not quite, but. That's funny. All right. We have another one. So just because we're all in this world of viruses now, and we just did a whole episode on the virome with Dr. Keisha. That's really interesting, everyone. It's just a mini episode, like a quick 15 minute one. So people should go back and listen to you. But this popped up and another virus that has garnered so much attention, obviously, for the last 40 years, the AIDS virus. And they've found that when used in gene therapy, they were able to use the AIDS virus to fix bubble baby disease. And bubble baby disease is that condition where literally the child's immune system doesn't work. And so they put them in a bubble, um, like a sterilized bubble, so nothing can hurt them, um, which is obviously a horrible way to live. And so they found that this, by altering the AIDS virus, they were able to give an immune system It was 48 babies and toddlers in this study, Um, and all but two of them were able to go on and have normal immune systems and healthy lives. When I hear things like that, that, first of all, like that's so, I I can't even wrap my mind around that, Um, dealing with that as like a parent, you know, as a child. But yeah, it's, again, we say this a lot, but we're in a nano second of our medical history, like realizing how all these things impact each other, you know? So it's really, it really is always to me eye-opening of how, you know, things like, like you said, AIDS, which, you know, I feel our entire adulthood has been just petrifyingly scary. Like the idea that it actually could be used for good. Isn't that wild? Like, yeah, it's just amazing. It's just, I mean, obviously I think Overall, people would prefer the AIDS virus didn't exist, but it is interesting when you start to look at, okay, how can we work with these things? And they just, they used a disabled, so basically how they did this, they removed some of the patient's blood, used a disabled AIDS virus to insert a healthy version of the gene that the kids need and return the cells through an IV. So it's like pretty minimally invasive. It's just wild. That's like, you know. Yeah. The answer is right there. And and who was the researcher that thought, hmm, let's try to inject some disabled AIDS into these kids well, exactly. and see if that, that works. That's, you know, like that's how does what's that amazing even... about science is like, you know, how, how do you actually, you know, that's where the innovation is, is, you know, talk about thinking outside the box of, you know, utilizing something. But it, it's like this uh, mRNA for COVID vaccine, like that was utilizing this thing that had been around for decades conceptually and they're like all right well you know hand was forced to find something quickly it's just amazing when they actually push what they can do you know yeah absolutely and you wonder like how much of this was stumbled on by accident like i always think about too the researcher who's like brand new to the field who has no preconceived notions of what will and won't work and just kind of maybe suggest something off the cuff and then it does work like that's so exciting So there is a whole push now. So the title of this one is food supplements that alter gut bacteria could cure malnutrition. So essentially they're saying that to save starving children, healthcare workers obviously have used food to help malnourished children, but now they're finding that feeding their gut bacteria might be as important or more important than feeding their stomachs. So they have started to develop foods that have different microbial properties that help their body unlock the nutrients of what they're eating. So like they're basically, whether it's probiotic or not, adding that to the food, is that just as simple as it sounds? Yeah, it says to combat malnutrition, health clinics often administer prepackaged, ready-to-use supplementary food, which is easy to store and turns into goo after needing. But malnourished children's health improved, improvements are rarely permanent. So basically like they don't have what they need in their oh, gut to gotcha. be able to have this be long lasting. Got it. And so now they're developing these foods that really help to feed the gut bacteria and 
grow the microbiome. And then these malnutrition supplements and all those types of things are more effective. Yeah, it makes sense. Like it's almost like the, you know, if you have depleted soil in a farm, it doesn't matter what you put after a while, it's just not going to grow. So conceptually, it's kind of the same idea. Like you got to rebuild that ecosystem, you know, to be able to get all the short chain fatty acids, all, you know, all the metabolomes off those organisms. So that's pretty interesting. It is interesting. And I think this is this type of stuff that we'll just start to see more of as we start to understand, because I'm sure for a long time, people were feeding kids food and then they're like, well, why aren't they getting better? You know, like, why isn't this working? I guess you could probably liken it too to like celiac disease. So like the celia in celiac disease, the, the actual things in your small intestine that pull in the nutrients, that's what gets blunted off and destroyed when people eat gluten that have celiac disease. So I'm sure there's something similar happening in a malnourished child where those are just so it like a like a muscle that doesn't get used. They're so weakened that they just can't pull in that nutrient, you know, all the nutrients that they're taking in. So the microbes must have some impact in breaking that down and making it more accessible. On a related note, did you know my dad got supplementation from UNICEF as a kid. Oh, really? No, I didn't know that. He went to a refugee school in uh, Beirut when he was little and they would give the kids fish oil and milk every morning. Wow. uh, To supplement. Yeah. UNICEF actually wrote about it. I'll I'll send you the article, but because of that, we actually just implemented this uh, roundup thing on biome to donate, you know, roundup if someone's orders, you know, $20.80 $20.80 to take it to $21 and the difference we send to UNICEF because, you know, they helped my dad out as, as a kid. That's it's amazing. Been, well, maybe we chat. can give them credit for feeding him fish oil because his brain obviously is working optimally. Yeah, <laughs> All the yeah, research he's been able to do. So it was probably their help with those supplements. Yeah. They literally wrote an article about it. Uh, I just shared it in the chat. It said, what led this renowned scientist to give back through UNICEF? Amazing. Uh, we'll link to that in the show notes too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. The last one here, Ohio State researchers identified changes in the gut microbiome after spinal cord injury. So this is the first time that they've been able to show that gut bacteria and viruses change after injury. And this was in mice, so I have to preface it with that. But I think this is has really far reaching implications for so much. I, it's almost so big to even start to talk about, but I'm curious, like your initial thoughts on that. And then we'll, we can dive into it a little. So doesn't entirely shock me because there's, there's been studies showing that when someone's admitted to the like trauma ICU, their microbiome changes. And a lot of times it's related to just that instant, um, stress that's put on, on our bodies that it totally adjusts the microbiome. So the idea that Obviously, if you're you have a spinal cord injury that is so severe that your body would instantly be thrown into shock. So it doesn't shock me, but it would be interesting to know, like, is it related to, you know, spinal cord fluid? Like what like what what are they attributing it to? But yeah, it's it's there's there's a big link between again, and you can tie it back to inflammation, you know, all sorts of of things, but you're talking on on obviously a very severe level with a spinal cord injury, but yeah. And I wonder how it changes. Maybe this is where this goes next. When someone has, I guess it would be really tough to do this unless, because you couldn't guess who was going to get the spinal cord injury. But if you had some database where are you better off if you have a balanced microbiome going into a severe injury like that versus a dysbiotic one, like is your recovery well, time better? You, like, do you have better oh, prognosis? That's interesting. Yeah, I would say you were definitely in a better state if it is balanced, because as we've talked about, when your gut is dysbiosis, the problem is some of the really aggressive pathogenic guys can start to spiral out of control. So if you're already imbalanced and now you become severely immunocompromised through an injury like this, one more thing your body has to battle. You, you see what I'm saying? So as opposed to like, if you have a really strong microbiome and yeah, it could be thrown out of whack, but strong basis, you know, any 
really aggressive guys are already probably under control. That's where my head goes, is that you're probably going to have an easier time if your microbiome is imbalanced. Yeah. I mean, that's essentially what they found is that several beneficial bacteria decreased and potentially pathogenic ones increased. And the same thing with viruses. And then this was very interesting too. Microbial genes encoding proteins for tryptophan, vitamin B6, and folate, the essential pathways for central nervous system function were also reduced. So I guess this would be more talking about like the postbiotics and what these microbes are able to help finagle while they're in there, you know, the, the different pathways of things that they're creating, which makes sense. Cause obviously if the right. microbes are, you know, decreasing or increasing, like the output is different, but yeah, it's just, you know, every time we do the show, I'm like, it's just tied to literally everything. Oh yeah. It's almost becoming cliche. Like it is right. Um, but again, like we've said before, we're in inning one of figuring all this out, you know, in, I'm, especially as fungi and viruses come more to light and they start getting research dollars, because again, it's still probably 25 to one research dollars go to study bacteria versus fungi and viruses in the gut. As those numbers start to creep up, we'll just see more and more ties, right? Well, and that's just the major three, right? There's even more microbial yeah, activity okay, yeah, that's yeah. happening that's like even smaller, but as we've learned, smaller doesn't necessarily mean less effective or less impactful. So totally. again, yeah, like we're at the very tip of like, okay, we're just learning what the bacteria do. And now, okay, let's add virus and fungi in. Okay, now let's add protozoa. You know, it's like, it's such a deep well that I don't even think we'll realize in our lifetime. Just mind blowing. That was an awkward silence. I'm staring, <laughs> I'm staring at my Spencer's gift poster. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> uh -oh. All right. Well, we'll end there for the day then. Afif, thank you so much as always. And everyone can find the show notes with all the links to everything at biomehealth.com slash pages slash podcast. Again, biomes B I O H M. And the podcast also for every listener is 15% off with the code POD15 on Biome's website. So, Afif, thank you so much as always. We'll talk to you later. All right. Take care. Bye. As always, thanks so much for listening. If you are enjoying the show, I'm going to make another urgent plea. Please, please, please go leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Or if you don't have iTunes and you're listening some other way, please share the episode with a couple of friends or family members who you think might enjoy it. Again, the show notes are at biomehealth.com slash pages slash podcast. I'm Andrea Ween, and we will catch you next time.